This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Another interesting week of Flames hockey, but finally something to be happy about. A four-game win streak for the Calgary Flames as we come into the trade deadline. And as usual, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, uh, can we be any more happy with this last week? Well, you know, to nitpick on the team, they did allow the first goal in a handful of those games. They won, but yeah, you got to harp on something. Jeez. (laughs) <laughs> Looking back on the week, when I was watching the Calgary-Nashville game, I was kind of worried in that game. The Flames took a bit of a lead, and then they blew the lead, and they ended up winning it 6-5. to five. But that game at the beginning, I thought, oh, crap, we're off to a bit of a train wreck here. Yeah, and the fact that they were able to right the ship and actually get the two points, sometimes stuff happens where... Like, you just make a mistake, and then it builds, and it builds, and it builds, and there's nothing you can do on a game like that. It just, they were able to stop the bleeding at the intermission and get the equalizer halfway through the third period with Backlund tying it and eventually get the winner. Yeah, I mean, early in the game, you know, Hamilton scored uh, 5-12 into the second for a 4-1 lead. Usually when you've got a 4-1 lead in the second, you're pretty much going to run away with that game. But, um, you know, Forsberg, Wilson, uh, Forsberg got a hat trick, and Wilson, you know, they came back and they rallied back. And it wasn't even our goalie's fault, I don't think. I thought that Elliott looked solid, as about as solid as you could expect in this one. Yeah, pretty much. Like, it... It, in the most of the goals that he surrendered, it, it was a bad clearing attempt by a defenseman, a turnover, bad positioning, losing a man. Uh, you can blame a goalie if he gives up a real stinker, but like if you got a guy like Philip Forsberg within 10 feet of the net taking a shot on you, it's either going to hit you or it's going in. And unfortunately for Calgary, they went in. And one of the things I think was the best news for the Flames in this one was that Goudreau tallied four points. I don't think there's been a game this season that we've seen Goudreau tally four points. I'm not sure, but yeah, I think it might be the first. And he's starting to get back into things, finally, after struggling for most of the season. Well, and you and I have talked about this too, of you know, should he be separated from Monaghan? And we saw the Flames this year or this week, I should say, put them back together with uh, Furland on their line. And I think that really, and, uh, you know, I've been a proponent of this all season, that's where those two need to be, is Monty and uh, Johnny need to be together. Yeah, and good on Furland for actually holding on to the puck and shooting it himself and trusting in his own shot. Hopefully he can continue to do that, because all three of those goals that he scored were nice in the last week well i think too this gives furlan a chance to try something a bit different i mean he came into this team he earned his position by being sort of the grinder and i think that now we have garnet hathaway taking that role so i think it lets furlan really experiment a little bit and be a little bit more of the sandpaper guy but still like you said shooting you know being the playmaker on that line i think we can experiment a bit see what we have michael furlan besides just toughness the second game of the week, the Calgary Flames played against the Tampa Bay Lightning, and this was a game I wasn't quite sure how it was going to go. Some people thought that we might see the Flames um, playing against the goaltender that could be the next Flames goaltender in this one, um, who didn't end up playing, but Ben Bishop. And the Flames ended up winning a 3-2 to two game over the Lightning. Um, I thought this was a fun game to watch. Monaghan got his 100th NHL goal, and for Lee collected his 300th career point. Monahan is the fastest flame to ever get 100 goals. And if you look back, and I did the math after this, Matt, as much as he struggled this year, he's he has four straight years of 20 goals or more. I mean, he's only been in the league for four years, and he's got 20 goals every year. That's that's impressive. Yeah, and especially nowadays with goal scoring not being what it is, it used to be, that's a very impressive mark, and he's the sixth fastest active player to hit 100 goals. 
Looking at this game overall, I thought there's a really good 60-minute effort from the Flames. I thought, unlike the previous game where they let it go at certain times and it caught up on them, I thought this was a great 60-minute effort and I think maybe one of the best road games they've played. If this can be their model for future road games, they're going to win a lot more away from the Dome. Yeah, and it early on in the game, they gave up the goal 6-17 into Vladislav Nemstiknikov, and it they didn't just deflate at that point and for most of the first period they carried the play and then they broke through finally in the second period and just kept putting the pressure on and keeping the lightning at bay until the last minute and giving up the second goal but it's just encouraging to see them continue to not be daunted when something goes awry like surrendering the first goal in the game which used to be almost a death sentence for this team Mm -hmm. we're starting to see a little bit of the find a way flames from two years ago we are i mean these two games it hasn't looked like they're finding a way maybe the nashville game but the tampa bay game i wouldn't say that was the find a way type of play that i mean the flames looked to me in control most that game true but it was more the next one that that I was referring to. Well, and before we go on to that one, I just wanted to get your thoughts. I think if you look at Elliot this week, and I really noticed this in the Tampa Bay game, he looked really solid. He is at 11 wins in his last 17 starts, and really this, I think, is the Elliot the Flames traded for. And I remember seeing online that somebody did a statistical analysis of his play in the first handful of months in the season, and... Even last year, he was only like a 909 save percentage with the Blues. And then, like, once the new year rolled around, he turned into the awesome version of Brian Elliott, where he was like, had like a 936 or something like that save percentage. And, but you could clearly see that once the new year hit, his level of play significantly jumped forward. And we, we've seen that this year where he struggled a lot more than he did last year, but he has similarly bounced back and is looking like a quality starting goaltender again. And that bodes well for the Flames' push towards the playoff spot. I think last year Elliot might have had some cushion there in how he looked because he had Jake Allen with him. And, I mean, they were really a 1A, 1B, and I think this year, as much as we've had Johnson look good, he was... I think we'd both agree that Johnson's been the backup. I agree. It, he had a great stretch at the end of November, early December, but then he's cooled right off again. And that's been a common feature with him throughout his career as well. That's so, why he doesn't have a legitimate starting job, I think. Yeah, just a very good backup. And and that's where it, I think that maybe Elliot's had to shoulder more pressure than usual. You know, he's used to being that 1A, 1B, and it's like now he's the 1A, the only A. Yeah, well, you also have to figure that he went from a team that had a very good overall team and system to Calgary, who had to have Kulak, uh, Yoki Paka, and Weidman playing for... And also a team uh, that's learning their new system. Yes, that as well. Well, let's jump into the next game then. This was the Calgary Flames the next night taking on the Florida Panthers. And you and I both last week in our predictions weren't sure how the Flames would do against the Panthers in a back-to-back game. Um, I thought the Flames might have started Elliott again, but they started Chad Johnson, who made 36 saves in a Flames 4-2 win. Troy Brower, I was surprised, notched a goal and an assist and uh, helped to help the Flames come on this one. We also got a Derek England goal his third of the year, which I wasn't expecting. Yeah, the Flames capitalized early, even though, realistically, Florida was the better team pretty much all evening, and, like, uh, Elliot didn't start because he lost almost 10 pounds just from the night prior, and it was a difficult game for him just due to the heat and humidity, going from Calgary weather to plus 25 Tampa weather is a little bit exhausting. So the the team it's played the Brian well. It's Brian Elliott weight loss plan. Yeah. Matt, you just gave it Go- away. You didn't make them pay us three equal payments at twenty five ninety five. Oh, jeez. 
giving away the store here. That's right. So, no, <laughs> and I think Johnson, I mean, Johnson needed this to rebound. His last start before this was February 13th when in the 5 nothing loss to the Coyotes. So he's probably a bit deflated after that one, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought in this game, I thought a big part of the the reason the Flames won was R- Roberto Luongo. I thought that the Panthers played well, but I thought that Roberto didn't show up as much as they needed him to. Yeah, and Luongo's showing his age. He's 39 now, and goalies, even guys like Broder and Law, they slowed down when they got up there like that. And... I wouldn't be shocked if Luongo's only got a year or two left in the NHL, and that will be it. And and we don't see a lot of him, but this is the first game to me that I've seen him play against the Flames where he really looked like he was showing his age. Definitely. Um, and in the Florida game, um, an interesting note, and I believe the Tampa game as well, let me just double-check, Dennis Weidman sat on the bench, which you and I had predicted last uh, last week that he would. Uh, yes, Dennis Weidman bench for both Yeah, ever since uh, Stone came aboard, he's so. Uh, we thought that might happen, and yeah, now he's sitting on the bench. And magically, the Flames are playing significantly better. I, it, it's almost as if one goes in hand with the other. The, like, TJ Brody was a minus 27 up until the time Stone was acquired, and since then he's already a plus four. So, it, it's... Not to harp on Weidman, but he's not an NHL player in terms of the type of game that is necessary in terms of foot speed. Well, look and at, looking at the games that we've looked at so far and the one coming up, what are your initial thoughts on Stone? He's pretty good. Expecting him to score at the pace he did last year is probably a little much, even though he's already tallied three assists in the four games he's played. You and I last year both thought he might be the Flames' new number four long term. Are you still thinking that after the first week? I there's nothing to dissuade me from keeping him. That's for sure. Like he's solid defensively, not the best player, but again, he's a number four, so you're not really expecting to have a like supremely awesome player as your number four anyway. Well, and I also think that if they re-sign him and they give him a summer to get comfortable here, we might see a different version of him coming to training camp than we're seeing now. His first week, he's moved a long way. It always takes that adjustment period, and especially for a team that's still adjusting their own their own system. We can't expect Stone to jump in in only a week. No, and he's still also recovering from a knee injury from last season, and starting to look like he's coming out of that so at least with him his foot speed is not detrimental unlike with Weidman so and he does like when he does make a mistake he doesn't compound it with making another two or three mistakes which leads to a good scoring chance or a goal against and another thing I've liked about him is that he's able to separate players from the puck really efficiently uh, pretty much on par with Derek England in that regard. And I'm kind of penciling him in as England's replacement long term. I think that's a good way to look at him. I think he's probably as gritty as England. I think he's a different type of player, and I want him to play differently. But yeah, you're right. Separating guys from the puck well, for sure. And I think that him and Brody are making a nice pairing so far. Yep. They complement each other for sure. And it's just a matter of seeing how the next 20 games go and hopefully he fits in and continues to excel because that will do nothing but good things when the flames make the playoffs are you still feeling like you'd be willing to pay the conditional third to sign him up oh for sure easily like uh, that uh, second or third and i can't even remember what the condition is for the other pick but yeah, who cares? Oh, sorry, it's the third right? and a conditional fifth. My bad. So, yeah, we've already yeah. paid the third. But, yeah, I'm willing to pay a fifth to lock him up. Yeah, and, like, that that's a joke, really, for what he brings. And, like, if, especially if the Flames can lock him up on, like, a four- or five-year deal, at just that, like, three-and-a-half to four Pay him Smeed per money. season. Yeah, uh, keep him there. The, that's a perfectly viable contract for the duration, and... You don't have to really worry about that and allow 
some of the kids to fight for the fifth and sixth spots. Well, I was going to say, based on what we see, I would be okay. I know a lot of people don't agree with me, but I'd be okay with Stone as the number four going into next year. I think I want those five, six spots to be given to younger players and hopefully one of them take that fifth spot from Stone. I would be perfectly fine, though, if the Flames can get Stone at a reasonable deal and still go out shopping to get someone like a Carl Alsner. And then it's, say, Stone and Shillington on the third pair. I think that would still be a great place for him, and I think we can get him fairly affordably for that role, too. Yeah, well, it, even if you went like a uh, with an affordable veteran like a Johnny Oduya, yeah. you know, like somebody that would be like $2 million bucks to be your number five. Yeah, for, and for sure. And throw one of the kids, you know, just somebody else. Yeah, but, no, for sure. Yeah, I, I just think that there's better number fours out there. I'm happy with him as our number four, but I think there's better number fours out there. And if you can snag one, you know, I think... Oh, yeah. If the price is right, you go for it. doesn't matter what position. Uh, well, let's talk about the last game of the week. Um, this was a, a good game for Johnny Hockey. Johnny Goudreau lit the lamp twice and added an assist. Well, Elliot made 34 saves in the Flames' fourth straight victory in this one over the Carolina Hurricanes, a game that we weren't really sure what the Flames were going to do. Um, overall thoughts, Matt? Well, it was nice to see them actually perform in an afternoon game. I can't remember the last time they won in Carolina, even. Like it, that's why I was somewhat considering that one to be a good potential for a loss, but... Carolina's a terrible hockey team. And and you could really tell in this game, too. The Flames aren't the best team in the league. But you, I don't know about you. After this one, I was almost counting counting my blessings, as they say. It's like, wow, we thought we've had some ups and downs this year. But look yeah, at this Carolina th team. Yeah, it's basically Rask and Ajo. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. Like, there's not a lot of talent on that team. And, you know, the one guy I always used to like to watch here was Jordan Stahl, and even he's getting older. Yeah, he, he wasn't really noticeable or effective. No, he's not. Hannafin, I was expecting more from. Like, they have some pieces that should be good, but they're just not not getting what they need out of those pieces. Stahlberg, Stempniak, I'm, I was surprised he was still around. I didn't know where he was this year, so I was surprised to see Stempniak's name out there. Yeah. Well, I think Stempniak's trying to go and collect all 30 teams' jerseys. There you go. Retire. With his name on it. Watch, he'll get 30, and then he can't get signed by Vegas. Yeah, that'd be disappointing. That's where he almost just, you know, trade me for anything. Trade me for the bag of pox. I'll sign there for a day. Just anything. That's right. Get, get my name on a jersey. Looking at the uh, the goal scoring here, we have Michael Furlan, who got his 11th of the year from Goudreau. Goudreau's 30th assist of the year and Brody's 20th assist. Johnny Goudreau scored his 12th of the year unassisted and then his 13th of the year from Monaghan and Brody. So, you know, that Johnny, I thought Johnny Hockey looked really good here. He had four assists earlier in the week. It looks like he's coming around now, doesn't it, man? Well, he earned third star of the week for his efforts, so he's definitely playing a lot better and that nice chip backhand pass to Furland on the breakaway was one of the better passes I've seen in the NHL this season. Yeah, for sure. And Goudreau now sits at eight points and four road victories. And not just a four-game winning streak, but a four-game road streak on this one, um, which is always harder to do. But I don't know. I'm just hoping it's not too little too late for Johnny Hockey right now. Oh no, it's not like it, the worst case scenario is if he continues to play even remotely as good as this, then the Flames will make the playoffs, and we'll see how he does there. So, it, if the Flames are going to make the playoffs, they need him to be playing at a reasonably decent rate, and this week's been encouraging in that regard. We talked earlier about initial thoughts on thoughts on Stone. We've seen. Bartkowski for a little bit longer. Any new impressions on him after last week of play? I'm getting less and less sold on his ability to stick in the lineup. I think he, Kulak, and Yoki Paka are more or less interchangeable. As I said last week, I still think Bartkowski is a great guy to have in the organization. Great depth for the AHL team and maybe your first call up. But if we were if we were in December. I don't think he'd still be wearing a Flames jersey. We're in November. I think just because of how deep we are in the season and the fact that as of 
really as of two days from now, the roster limit is lifted. I think he'll stick around. Yeah. And also one thing from this week that was nice to see was Dougie Hamilton photobombing everybody. Yes. In, after the games. It's good to see that the team's loosening up a bit. For those and, that didn't see it, just explain what happened to everybody. Oh, well, whenever anybody else was being interviewed, he'd be just lurking in the background, making weird faces, holding a banana phone, and just doing random Dougie Hamilton things. And I'll tell you, I've had the chance to go down into the dressing room for some of the home interviews this year, and it's a very... It's a very somber attitude in there for most of the games I've been to. You know, these guys aren't playing great hockey in a lot of the games I've been to. They're l losing some of the games, and you can just tell there's this defeated feeling on their face and that frustration that's coming over them. And so, yeah, it's nice to see that it's limbering up. And Dougie especially is not a guy who's overly charismatic, so to see him doing that, that's really fun. And I think, like you said, just shows everyone's having fun and they're limbering up. And often the teams that we see that do the best are the ones that are having fun doing it. So that's awesome. Uh, well, Matt, anything else in the last week you want to talk about? Not really. I'm looking forward to talking about the trade deadline. Let's talk about that. So we're recording this on the 27th of February. Hopefully we'll have it out before the actual deadline buzzer sounds on the 1st. Um, but we will, we've will. we been looking forward to this day all year, as we always do. And it's almost trade deadline. The Flames already made their big move with the uh, Stone move, bringing in Stone from... Uh, what was the exact deal here? It was the 2017 third round pick and conditional 2018 fifth round pick. If Michael Stone resigns here to the Coyotes for Michael Stone, and we've seen this in the past. We saw last year. You know, we had um, Hoodler who went a bit early, but it's trade deadline time. And Matt, any wild predictions for the trade deadline? I think the Flames will go out and get a right winger. It just. It I think what's going to likely happen is you have cheap options and you have expensive options. Like somebody like again, like we mentioned last week, that's a cheaper option because of his age and he's struggling and the avalanche are terrible. Then there are expensive options like Evander Kane, Radim Verbata, and like other younger players that are under contract and like not needing to be protected in the expansion draft things like that where it may end up working out that that's how it shakes down it might not but i think that come this time next week we'll be talking about whichever right winger we acquire i i do not see the flames not adding another top six forward I, I don't know if it'll be a guy who's a legit top six forward now or a guy like Stone who they think maybe could be next year. That's also possible. I just think the and price for a legitimate one is going to be too high. Yeah, and you might see somebody like a Val Flipkula or even a Tyler Johnson, somebody who's decent but struggling and on a struggling team if the price isn't too bad. It just largely depends on what the acquisition cost is as well. Like, if the Flames are able to get even, like, a left winger that's for cheap, but who's a legitimate left winger like, say, a Patrick Sharp, then you might be able to play that guy on his off wing or move one of your other left wingers over or something. It largely just depends on whatever the price is and is that player able to contribute next year or are you just buying them for like the last 20 games of the season like if the flames were to go get a Ginla? well let's talk about that so that's the interesting thing this year is the expansion draft and the implications of that so the flames will probably go the road of acquiring of protecting three defensemen five forwards one goalie do you agree Pretty much. I think only Nashville would go 4-4. Four, four. So in that case, um, if we take a look, I think there's no question on the back end we protect Giordano Brody Hamilton. Yep, which definitely. Fi which five forwards do you protect? Obviously, Goudreau Monaghan. 
Yeah. Um, Backland for a leak. If Bennett's requiring it, obviously yeah, him. Is he? I'm not sure if he is. Yeah. If he is, then yeah. If not, then I guess Brower. So I guess in that case, then the question that I would start to ask is if we bring in another player and if we go out and get a, when I say legitimate, I mean like already established, but an established top six forward, are we then willing to either not ex to expose one of the guys we just talked about protecting or protect that guy? And for that reason, I think you're going to see most of the deals done on the deadline. And the deal I think Calgary will do is for a rental. Yeah, that's what I'm assuming as well. I think it's a guy who you say, you know what, we'll audition you for 20 games, we love you, we'll sign you on the first, but I don't think we can afford to go out and get a guy with a term contract because I don't want to lose Froelich, I don't want to lose Backlund because of that. No, and that's where the problem lies. And even a guy like Brower, you, you, despite his contract, he's a, a valuable player, especially when it comes to the postseason. So you don't want to lose that either. And I agree with you, but I think it depends who we could bring in. Yeah, like if you get, a, say, a Vander Kane for a reasonable price, then, yeah, you expose Brower well, so and to me, just call it a day. And, and if we could keep Brower, which I think you would in an expansion draft, great. But if he becomes the, you know, the sacrifice for bringing in a Kane, to me that's a worthy sacrifice. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And... I just that's that where it largely just depends on the who and the what like who it is and what does it cost like if well and knowing your, how your deadline goes i think that there's gonna be stupid price paid for kane yeah oh same here and like i i even wouldn't be opposed especially with this year's draft not being up to snuff um like, I wouldn't be shocked if the Flames are dangling their first-round draft pick, especially if the it's more in the 20 range than, like, 12 or 13. If it makes sense, sure, but, I like, I don't see the Flames, like, pulling a trade like uh, Minnesota did with Hansel. Well, I'd say that the there's going to be so many buyers this year that a guy like Kane is going to be bid way up. Yeah, and we've seen Shattenkirk get dealt today, and it's just, there's only so many high-end draft picks to go around, and yeah, I just don't see the Flames going out and spending that much for a rental. I, I would rather, I would more expect them to wait till the draft itself, Yeah, because like, by then the expansion draft's done, if I recall correctly. So like, there. Yeah, the expansion draft is the it's the weekend of the um it's the weekend of the awards ceremony. So it'll be done yeah. before the before the entry draft. Yeah. So like, I could see the Flames dealing their first in like a Dougie Hamilton style trade for a viable right winger. Then, it, you know, even sending like a first and a second for insert random young player here than doing it now well i think the other nice thing about doing it at the draft is there's always that one team who found a playoff hero and some young kid and there's always that one team that seems to trade away a veteran in order to you know give that kid a bigger role and you might be yeah. able to pick that guy up at the deadline or not the deadline the draft for cheaper yeah or like if you because we mentioned him patrick sharp when the blackhawks had to cut salary you might be able to capitalize on a situation like that where you can target a team who doesn't have a lot of cap space and snag a good player from them for that. If you look at True Living's history over his past three seasons as Flames GM, it really seems to be that if he doesn't have a plan for a guy, he tries to get something of value back for them. You look at Reinhardt's, you look at Barchi's, guys like that. They've managed to flip a lot of the assets from the Jerry Feaster regime for draft picks and then either use those picks outright, taking guys like Rasmus Anderson, Phillips, etc., or using them to move up like they did to, to draft Shillington um, or solving other problems like bringing in Elliott, bringing in um, Hamilton, Hamilton even. So, you know, I, I'm, I guess this is – since True Living has been the GM here, I've been the most confident I think I've been for a while on deadline day. And I think this year is going to be the same. 
Some people have suggested that he might go out and make a big deal just trying to save his job because he doesn't have a contract, and I don't see him doing that. I think there's a smarter guy than that. And if he doesn't have a deal next year, you don't want other teams to look at you and go, oh, that's that idiot that made X deal at the deadline. Yeah, like the Kota Leak trade. Yeah, and I and I think, well, at that point, Feaster wasn't fighting for his job. but I think No, it, that was uh, one of the Sutter's last trades. Oh, that's but. right. But, I mean, Sutter also didn't expect to get fired. He still had time in his contract. Yeah. But I think that if you are if you don't have a contract and if you're looking ahead saying, geez, I might need a job next year, that trade deadline is going to be so fresh in people's heads come the summer. You don't want that yeah, to Yeah, then be all the good remember. work that you've built up over the last couple of years to go to waste. Exactly. So Yeah, no, like I'm not expecting the Flames to like burn their first for some rental guy. Like say, just to insert name Patrick Sharp just because oh we need a top six forward and he fits the bill like I, i'm not expecting anything like that uh just a quality value deal like stone like that was a good value a third round pick and a conditional fifth and see how it goes so you've mentioned patrick sharp a few times he is wearing number 10 in dallas he's one of their alternate captains his cap is 5.9 million this year which means he has 1.3 million remaining on the cap hit. Um, what would you think? What would do you think? I mean, I think Sharp would be good here, especially if we're looking for a playoff role run. It gives us a little bit of more of a veteran presence. But what would you be willing to give up to bring Sharp in? Probably like a more prospect, like Poirier and something. Like I don't. He's had a bit of a down year. He only has 15 points in 36 games. So, like, I wouldn't be giving up much. But I think that's where, as the Flames, you more buy him to be a third-line guy. Yeah. And realistically, the Flames just need a middle six guy anyway, so... Yeah. I wouldn't be wanting, like, to spend a second plus a decent prospect. It would just be, like, a prospect and like a lesser pick like if you could get him for like Poirier in a fourth or something like that I think that'd be fine yeah no I think that Sharp would be good here like you said I think Poirier might be good there's some other lower end forward prospects I mean if you could get him for Hunter Smith that'd be fantastic um, but I don't think you're gonna go that low mm -hmm. um, but yeah I think that would be good another guy I've been looking at over the last week and I don't know if they'd sell because they're sort of still in the playoff hunt but um, I think that Drew Stafford could be a good rental. That's possible, too. He plays both wings. He's 31. He's not that expensive, and there's a guy I could also see the Flames targeting in the offseason. Um, let me throw out a couple crazy names to you, Matt. If Shane Doan decides he's had enough of the Coyotes because his buddy Hansel just got traded, do you see True Living going after Shane Doan? I could see it, but I don't see Shane Doan wanting to come here. I think he's locked in and going to California. So if the price is right, sure, but I just don't see it. Um, and that's that's from his point of view. Like I, I think he wants to go to a team that could actually win the Cup. And Calgary, even though they're likely going to be a playoff team, I don't see them being that good yet. So... Yeah, just from his, he holds the cards. So I, I, if I was him, I wouldn't bother going to here or even Los Angeles or Nashville or any of the other bubble teams. What about a guy like Radom Verbata out of, um, out of that? Phoenix? I could see. He's making a million bucks this year. Thirty-five year old, not somebody you probably want to bring in again next year, maybe. But at that kind of money, you could easily do get that deal done, and. I think Verbata, I wouldn't re-sign this year if I brought him in just because he could be attractive with that kind of money to Vegas. But, you know, bring him in, give him a tryout, maybe bring him in as a veteran guy next year. He'd be the cheapest veteran we've signed in a few years. Yeah, I I would not want to get Verbata just due to the fact that he's owed performance bonuses and the acquiring team will have to pay them out. So... Like, the Flames will be on the hook for $2 million in cap space for next year for acquiring him. So you're almost, even though he's, so you're almost thinking let him stay in uh, stay in Arizona or wherever they deal him this year and then sign him July 1. Yeah. 
I I just wouldn't touch that, especially with the Flames cap situation. Like, we're tight on the cap anyway. That's true. And we've got performance bonuses for Bennett and Kachuk to worry about, so that's, yeah, I just wouldn't touch that, because we're probably going to have overages anyway. So you and I have talked about the Flames potentially bringing in TJ Oshie in the offseason as a free agent. Would you try to acquire him at the trade deadline? Well, no, because Washington, they're loading up. They just got Shattenkirk, so they're not going to be in seller mode. They want to win the Cup, so that's going to be a off-season thing. I wouldn't mind trading for him at the draft, like his rights, if that's well, but, possible. But even now, you don't have to do that because any team's allowed to start talking to players one week before free agency opens. Yeah. Um, I think you still see that, though, where... Some guys will do that. What but. What about a guy like Alex Hemsky? Yeah, that's another one of those bargain bin. Like maybe, sure, I guess. I think maybe but. I have a negative taste in my mouth from Hemsky because I still remember him as an Oiler. Yeah, like that wouldn't be the worst possible but I, addition but i don't know i'm like, almost yeah. looking at it thinking you know what if hemsky is the best of let's say he's the best available for what we're willing to pay forward i'd almost rather keep the asset yeah like uh, honestly i'd rather go after like somebody like a brian gianta from buffalo Hemsky's only than... played one game this year yeah is he hemsky hurt? has yeah is he hurt or is he just scratched Hurt, I think. Okay, so we wouldn't probably get him this year. Um, what about a and again a team that probably isn't going to be selling, but um, uh, Justin Williams out of Washington. Uh, same reason as Oshi. They're trying to win the cup, so I don't see that. Wouldn't mind him on July first, but yeah. So I think as far as wingers go, there's not a lot there. I can't see Montreal selling Radulov. No, like that's why, like you're basically talking about again, La Sharp, Giantas, your maybe most Stafford. viable. Yeah, like uh, those are basically your most viable mm -hmm. options, and I'm sure one of them will be a flame. It's just waiting and seeing. So I mean, you you had talked about moving on from Emil Poirier. Emil Poirier for a while was seen as one of the blue chip prospects in this organization. Have you kind of given up on him? Not yet, but it's one of those situations where if you can extract value for him, then sure. Yeah, I was about to say for me, I think he's I think there's other guys that might be surpassing him and I think now is the time to sell high. I think we wait till next year. You're not going to get nearly as much for Poirier, so I think no, yeah. you might get like a sixth round pick next year if you keep on him and he doesn't improve. Yeah, so I think sell Poirier high and move on to somebody else. Um, Poirier is also I don't know. He's had some up and down years, um, but he's a I mean he's a right winger. People should keep him around for that. But there's to me more promising right wingers in the system than him. Yeah, and. The Flames, like, when it comes time for the draft, if they still have their first, that you can focus a, that pick on a right winger instead, or whatever, or use it to trade for one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Either way, I, like, we'll figure it out. But, I mean, looking at the prospects to give up, because to me, I don't want to give up any roster players. I don't think there's any roster no. player besides Weidman um, who we need to move or who I would want to move. Like, I think this roster for what I can see moving at the deadline, I don't see any advantage to moving one of our players. No, like even having like, I know some people want, uh, Lance Bulma to be moved, but he's a valuable player and that type of guy. Like if they, he gets hurt, we do have a redundancy, but if we move him and Hathaway gets hurt, then, you're stuck with either Hamilton or some other really inexperienced player yeah, like Lyndon Vay. At the same and time, that's not though, a I think Boma might be one of the few selling chips or bargaining chips we have on our roster, so I could see him moving just because of that. Yeah. And I think if you want to get rid of a salary like Weidman's, you may have to move Boma to make it attractive. That's possible. Um with two new defensemen coming in over the last few days, with both Bartkowski and Stone coming in, 
besides Dennis Weidman, do you see any other defensemen potentially on their way out? Uh, just Weidman. Maybe Yoki Paka, if for some reason a team wants him uh, included in a deal. That that would be about it. Yeah, I think you'd have and to, in you'd that have to case, be like it in would. Something. Yeah, it'd be like if the Flames say they want got a good price on a quality number six, and the cost was Yoki Paka, then okay, sure. But yeah, there's not really much of a need to do that. See, and if we look at the Calgary Flames right now, they're sitting at seventy points, which puts them in the first wild card spot in the West. Um, they are the next two teams are St. Louis at sixty seven and LA at sixty four. So I can see us going out and trying to make some minor moves for veterans, and I could see us maybe trading, sort of like you were saying, Yoki Paka for a veteran five six guy. Yeah, just. Like, somebody like a Ben Lovejoy or something like that. Like, Yoki Paka plus, like, a sixth or something for someone like that. Not him specifically, but you know what I mean. Like, just a okay, decent depth guy. Yeah, I mean, looking around the league at guys that might fit that role, um, a lot of them, again, not... I would love for it to be Kulikov, but he, they're not going to trade him this year. Um, at least not for that price. I could see us going after him in the off season. Um, if Dallas is out of it, Johnny Oduya could fit that. Yep. Um, I I think Cody Franzen will be in play, but I don't think it'll be to us. No, uh, and he'll cost too much he because of his height. What, and that's about it. What about <laughs> what about an older guy like um, Zabanek McCulloch as that five six guy? Yeah, he's actually not as good anymore. He's more or less like a slightly better version of Grossman at this point. So, you think no he's need. that you think he's that bad? Yeah. No, he's okay, but at that rate I'd just rather keep whatever we have. I don't think the Florida is going to be a seller, but one guy I think could fit that uh model. Uh, like it's it's hard to know if they're going to be a seller or not, but they've got a couple defensemen who could fit that model. Um they probably won't trade Orlov because he's an RFA, but he'd be a nice fit there. Oh. And then, I but I really think Michael Stone was our big defensive piece. I don't see us getting somebody else. Yeah. It could be, but it, I don't see it being the number one priority. No, and I think that the Flames are probably happy with what they have if they need to go with what they have. Um, yeah, it's more of a like to have yeah. than a I need to have. Where like the right winger is a need to have. Mm -hmm. If so. if and again, I don't think that the Panthers are thinking themselves out of it, but I could see doing something like doing um, Yakupov for uh, Yakub Kindle. Yeah, that's a possibility. But I just don't think they're out of it. Um, yeah, I don't know. It'll be interesting, but I think that's a lot of what we're going to see is sort of younger piece, not prospect, but younger piece for expiring older piece. I could even see a guy like Chase on being moved in the same kind of vein of let's give up a younger right winger to a team that's out of it who doesn't want to take on a contract for the expansion draft either. For an older right winger, it gives us some veteran presence. That's what I think will be most of what we're going to see on deadline day. Yeah. Do you think at this point, with the Flames right now sitting in a good playoff spot, we see either of the goalies move? I could see the Flames dealing Chad Johnson if they can get somebody better, but I, I think the odds on that is more like dwindling to like 10%. I think the fact that Bishop's already been moved opens up the goalie market a lot for us, which I'm kind of glad he got moved early because it gives us that option. But I think at the same time, the Flames are perfectly happy to keep what they've got right now. Well, both of them are playing well, so that's all you need. And I think you could get by a couple rounds, maybe one, maybe two rounds in the playoffs with this tandem. I agree. Um, so, Matt, if you look ahead to the deadline day, what would be the worst thing the Flames could do? What would have you, you know, kicking your computer um, if the flames end up doing or not doing that at deadline day well if the flames stand pat that's fine like I, i'm not really concerned if uh that's what it ends up being um 
the worst case scenario would be if they traded too many assets for somebody that they're not going to be able to keep or is going to displace the roster in some fashion, but you would be pissed off if that happened at any point. Like, sort of like the reaction after the Fanuf trade or the Jokinen trade. Yeah, I mean, a couple of years ago, we had times we said, we have to move a Gindler. We have to move Jokinen. I don't think we're in that kind of a... Or not Jokinen, sorry, Bo Meester. And I don't think we're in that kind of a situation this year. There's nobody I look at that we have to move. And I think as much as we all want Weidman to move, it's a tough contract to move. And I think we've all resigned and we may just have to eat that deal for the rest of the year and sit him in the press box. Yeah. So, like, if that's how it shakes out, that's how it shakes out. I'm not overly concerned one way or the other. One last question for you. Um, looking at what we were talking about earlier with the three defensemen, five forwards worth protecting, some teams have too much of that. And what would you think about the Flames doing a deal, say trading something like Bennett for Truba, knowing that both teams you know, have something that they need to protect and could help each other out there? I wouldn't bother. I think you're, you know, like uh, w it'd just be quicker and easier just to toss LA or Las Vegas, uh, late round draft pick or some other thing to not take that player instead. I don't see that being overly a a problem for sure. Well, Matt, in the vein of uh, trade deadline, why don't I take a look at some of the best and worst picks of the Flames trade deadlines over the years? Um, we've had some real stinkers, and if you think about the Flames for the most of their career, most of the time here, they've been sellers. They have not usually been in a buying position. So, if we take a look at some of the trades that they've made over time that are interesting, um, one of the guys that was very popular here in the 0304 run was Chris Simon. And if you remember the trade that brought him here, it was trading Blair Betts, Jamie McLennan, and Greg Moore to the Rangers for Simon a seventh round pick. And I mean, we could argue if you know Simon is a a good flame or not, but he was definitely popular, and he was almost the Michael Furlan of that specific Cup run. Um, and it was a good deal. It was a shrewd move that made a lot of sense, and he was cheap, I believe, too. One of the other big trades a lot of people remember, um, and this was really the last of the 89 team being dismantled, but the Flames sent Paul Ranheim, Gary Suter, and Ted Drury to the Hartford Whalers in exchange for the younger Michael Nylander, James Patrick, and Zarly Zalepski, and that was 1994. And eh, if you take a look back, the trade didn't push the Flames all that high, but they were able to get two important defensemen and... Nylander was here for a while too, so this was really a, um, you know, a trade that made the Flames younger. Suter was traded the next day, and uh, Ted Drury. Well, I mean, he's he was there, so I think that was really the start for me. If you look at those guys, that was really the start of kind of the late '90s Young Guns team. Those guys were here for a while. Looking back at a trade from last year. David Jones got traded to the Minnesota Wild for a sixth-round pick and Nick Backstrom. And this, if anyone remembers, snuck in just right before the deadline. This was one of those trades we were scratching our head going, really? They got it done? And it was, I mean, we all thought oh, maybe they could have got better for Jones in a sixth-round pick. But if you look at what that sixth-round pick became, the Flames drafted Matthew Phillips, who's had a fantastic year in the WHL. He's scored 43 goals and is currently two goals out of first for the entire league. So I don't want to say he's going to be an NHL player, even a superstar yet, but as a six-round pick, that's a heck of a deal. And I would, you know, I'd trade a guy like Jones for that any day. Another trade in the last couple of years everyone's going to remember, Curtis Glenn crossed sent to the Washington Capitals for a second and third-round pick. And we all remember at the time that uh, that came together for the Flames, quite well. They need to get rid of Glenn Cross. They made that deal. And then going along with that, if you look at it, Sven Berchi to the Vancouver Canucks for a second-round pick. Uh, those were done two days after each other. And altogether, those two trades provided the draft capital necessary to acquire Hamilton, Shillington, and Anderson. So if you take a look, the Flames got really, if you want to break it down, Dougie Hamilton, Oliver Shillington, and Rasmus Anderson for Curtis Glenn Cross and Sven Berchi. That's a heck of a deal. I'd take that any day. One of my favorite Flames trades of recent memory was still in uh, March 5th, 2014, when the Flames traded Red O'Bara to the Colorado Avalanche for a second-round pick. 
And that second round pick was eventually used to take Hunter Smith, but a great steal. I remember looking at that on deadline day going, really, really, we were able to pull that off. I mean, Barra was really a, a marginal backup goalie at the time. And he was just one of these guys who was there and he, his real strength, I guess, was the shootout. But we've also made some stinkers at the deadline and hopefully you guys don't remember these anymore. I'm sorry to open up old wounds, but there's been some real stinkers. And a few of these have come in the Feaster era. I don't know if that tells us something about Feaster. February 28th, 2011, the Calgary Flames trade a seventh round pick to the Atlanta Thrashers for Frederick Modine. Yeah, I mean, it was a low value for a low value, which was one thing. Um, but at the, I don't think that Modine ever ended up playing for the Flames. And who else was available that deadline? Sergei Samsonov, Chris Higgins, Brad Boys. There's better things we could have got. Um, oh, I'm just checking here. Modine did play four games for the Flames and then retired. So, I don't know, 36 years old. He was a couple years past his prime. That I remember a lot of people thinking it was a stinker. Another one that was a stinker at the time was the first ever trade between the Calgary Flames and the Edmonton Oilers on March 3rd, 2011. Another Jay Feaster deal. And it was Aaron Johnson, a third round pick to the Oilers for Steve Steos. And I don't know. I don't know what you can say that was good. The Flames overpay for an expensive and old defenseman who wasn't going to turn the team's fortunes around. And he was brought in for leadership, but... They already had a lot of leaders at that point. And looking back at the roster, he and Corey Sarich must have been probably the most expensive third-pairing defenseman we've ever had. So that was uh, eh, that was an interesting trade, I remember, at the time. I'm like, well, this guy's old. Why are we bringing him in? Maybe one of the weirdest trade deadline moves or worst decisions the team made was in 2014 as well when they decided not to trade Camilleri. I remember sitting around saying, this is the only asset we've got, and he's going to be leaving, and do we really want to um, keep him around here and lose him for nothing? And I think the consensus at the time was everybody wanted to trade him. Well, everybody except for the interim GM at the time, which was Brian Burke. And he was looking for a first-rounder bust. He wasn't looking for anything lower. And I still think if we could have got a second round, maybe a second and a prospect for Cammy, it would have been great. But to me, that's one of the, especially in this regime, I sort of look at the post-Feaster era as a new regime, the Burke that you're living. Um, yeah, I just think that was one of their biggest misses. And we probably could have got at least a top 100 pick for that. A couple other trades that are probably still sticking in the minds of Flames fans in 2013 when you could arguably say that the the rebuilding era of the Flames kicked off. And the first trade that happened there was the Jerome McGinley trade, March 27th. Jerome McGinley got traded to the Pittsburgh Penguins for Kenny Agostino, Ben Hanowski, and a first-round pick. And Agostino and Hanowski are long gone. So, mm, I don't know. That was... a. Uh, that was a weird trade. Everyone at the time and still to this day thinks we should have got more for Jerome. But you know what? It is what it is, and that happened. And then a few days later, about five days later, the Calgary Flames moved their other big asset, and that was Jay Bowmeister, the St. Louis Blues, for Red O'Bara, Mark Kandari, and a first-round pick. So really, if you take a look, um, I'd say Bowmeister was one of the Flames' best players at the time. He was moved for an AHL defenseman, a guy who... I never liked Kandari. I never saw much in him. I thought this is a, a career AHLer, and I turned out to be right. An AHL goalie, which, yeah, okay, we brought him up because he was the best thing we had. And a first-round pick, who we've used on what might amount to an AHL forward. It just, I don't know, that was a really bad trade for the Flames at the time. So they've they've had some hits, they've had some misses. And I think as we get more good players, more things we might be able to trade out there, there's a lot of things that we could do, like Matt and I have talked about, of what are we going to do here? Like, what is the option to trade? And hopefully we have one of the the years that is making an impact on the pro side than the con side, because there's been some terrible flame stuff over the years, and I don't want 2016 to fall into that. I think that as we move forward, the Calgary Flames may be making smarter trades, not always big trades. They don't need to be rocking the boat or making the biggest deal on deadline day but they need to be making a trade that makes sense for them, even if it's just a couple small pieces, and that's how you make it to the playoffs. That's how you go deep. If you look the last couple of years, all the teams that made 
the the playoffs or made it deep in the playoffs were the ones that made smart trades, hockey trades. And yeah, since you're gonna have to go out and break the bank and bring in a rental, this isn't the year for that for the Flames. So we'll see what happens on the deadline and hopefully there's some trades that are gonna be memorable here. So Matt, those are some pretty interesting trades the Flames have made, both good and bad over the years. Do you have a most memorable Flames trade, either a stinker or one that you thought really helped the team? Well, one that I disliked at the time was uh, when the Flames traded Theo Fleury, but we ended up getting Regeer out of the deal, so it worked out in the long run, just like the Aginla trade. Well, yeah, uh, you have to remember in that trade, too, Regeer had two broken legs at the time. Like, he was just kind of a throw-in because Colorado wanted to get rid of him. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, And, you know, some of the things like the code leak deals, some of the terrible deals haven't been at the deadline. So we've we've done some I don't know some interesting things the deadlines I profiled but I think one of the one of the ones that I remember most fondly was when we fleeced Colorado for a second for Barra. Yeah, that was a good one. In recent memory, and one of the worst in the Feaster era was probably that uh, Modine trade. Well, that was just kind of a useless acquisition. Yeah, I mean the guy played like four games here and then retired, and he was past his prime anyways. But that's one of those examples of, you know, the GM bringing in his own people because he was familiar with them. Mm-hmm. So let's hope we don't make anything dumb like that this year. Um, so Matt, looking at around the league, we've talked a lot about the Flames, but as we get near the trade deadline, there's a lot of news around the league, and you pointed this one out. Uh, there was a mumps outbreak in Vancouver. A lot of the Canucks players have the mumps. And you looked back at the schedule and realized that the Flames played them during the incubation period. So that's uh, that could be a bit scary for this team. Yeah, it takes 12 to 25 days for uh, someone to develop it if they've been infected. And the Flames played them last week. So unfortunately, the Flames, you know, we might be seeing news this time next week that, oh, X player or X players have contracted the mumps. Like today, uh, Zach Parise and I do believe Jason Pominville were uh, diagnosed with it. So how long is a guy out for the mumps? I honestly don't know. I think it's a week, two weeks. Okay, well, I'm glad that it's after the deadline, so we don't not make any trades because some guy's the mumps. But maybe we can find out who's the most contagious, send them to other teams in the West. Um, But, you know, if you look next week, that's about the 6th, so we have a three-day break there, but that's right when the Flames get into their every-other-day schedule. So if we have a bunch of guys sick at that point, that could really tank us. Well, hopefully... It's nobody got it. Is there anything the team can do? No, not really. That's crazy. Just to isolate the people that do get it. So looking around the league at happier news, there's been a lot of trades made already, as we usually see going into the trade deadline. Um, do you want to give some quick thoughts on all of these trades, Matt? Sure. Why not? So Alex Burrows was traded from the uh, Vancouver Canucks to Ottawa for Jonathan Dolan, and then Burroughs has already signed a two-year deal on that one, which kind of surprises me. Thoughts on that trade? Uh, it Highway robbery for Vancouver. Dolan's actually a decent prospect, and I don't understand why Ottawa traded him for Burroughs. Yeah, I don't know. I think Ottawa's trying to... And, I mean, Ottawa signed him already, so he's not a rental, but I think they're trying to get some more vets in that lineup. Yeah, and they're a playoff caliber team so i think they're trying to make it so that way they're playing one of the better teams not or one of the weaker teams instead of like whomever the wild card team is or uh the capitals well they're also a pretty young team in ottawa if you look at their roster so i think this is good for them it brings some veteran line some veteran presence on it for a couple years Mm mm-hmm The next one that really surprised me, I don't know if uh, L.A. realizes they can only play one goalie at a time, but L.A. made the big deal to get Ben Bishop, who was supposed to be one of the key pieces. It was Bishop plus a fifth-round pick in 2017 to L.A. L.A. for Peter Budai, uh, Cernick, and a seventh-round pick. Um, Odd. I'm really surprised by this. I think it's an odd pickup for L.A. What do you think? Yeah, like Peter Budai has played extremely well this season, and... 
What does he get as a thank you? Oh, you're out the door. Well, that's it. I mean, if nothing else, you at least, I think, should reward the guy by keeping around all year. He saved your butt while Quick was out. Yeah. But that's appreciation for you, and, you know, that's not a nice way to go about things. But the price for Bishop was rather affordable. Uh, yeah, I was surprised I actually how expected... he went for. Yeah. I was, no big deal. I was like, expecting uh, the return on him to look more like the Hansel return, but yeah. Um, but you know what this tells me too, if I'm a GM in the West, is Quick's probably not at 100. percent Yeah. I don't think you make a deal like this so Bishop can sit on the bench. You know, even in the playoffs, you generally don't see teams with a one A one B. I really think they're bringing in Bishop probably to play most of the minutes and have Quick sit. Mm hmm. Um, but the next trade, I think, is probably the most interesting to me so far. Martin Hansel, Ryan White in a conditional fourth to Minnesota for the first round, the second round, and a conditional pick. The next trade is the most interesting one. Um, this was the Minnesota Wild trying to get their hands in things, acquiring Martin Hansel, Ryan White, in a conditional fourth round pick for Minnesota's first, their second, and a conditional pick. Um, that's a fourth if they lose round one, a third if they lose round two. This, to me, is a smart trade by Minnesota. Minnesota's got a lot of great prospects in their system. I kind of envy their their prospects sometimes. And in this case, they're giving away a first and a second in a probably crappy draft, if you talk to most people, and not having to touch any of their existing prospects. And I think that's why you saw the price tag be a little higher than... Because, like, Martin Hansel's just a decent third-line center. And for that, it seems like an overpay, but the fact that they didn't have to include any of their good quality prospects was a win for them. Minnesota is a team that's really good on the faceoff dot. I think Hansel will help that, but he's also not going to be looked at, I don't think, to be a top six guy. He's really that insurance marker, that bottom six, probably your third line centerman, as you mentioned. And I think this is really going to help Minnesota. I don't think this is necessarily going to get them a cup, but I think this really shores up some depth on that team. Yeah, it's sort of like uh, when Nashville acquired Paul Gostad a number of years ago. Just some decent guy that you can stick out there, you'll win face-offs and be good on both ends of the ice. The next trade was a guy that I thought we might see end up in Calgary. Um, Patrick Eves went to Anaheim for a second-round pick, and if Anaheim wins the conference finals, that pick becomes a first-round pick, sort of like the Chris Russell conditions. I had a feeling we might see Patrick Eves in Calgary, but I'm glad we didn't at this kind of asking price. Oh, for sure. And I'm always leery when a depth guy like Eves magically has a good season on a bad team. And usually that player tends to not transition to their new team very well. So, like, while he's a decent third, fourth line guy, I don't see him continuing his pace. Yeah, and I mean, you always see this, it sort of evens out over the whole deadline day. You see a guy like Hansel and White who got, you know, maybe arguably the return could have been better. And then Patrick Eves, who, you know what, Anaheim paid a steep price for this guy. So it all evens out in the end. Mm -hmm. um, the next one was Brian Boyle to Toronto, and this is not where I expect him to go, for Byron Frossy and a second round pick. I think, that's about right. I think Brian. I think Boyle's return is about right. I think that's a fair price for him. I think this is really good in Toronto. I actually honestly expected Boyle to end up in Edmonton. Yeah, so did I. And the fact that you, whomever, will not have to face the six seven pain in the <clears throat> in the playoffs in the Western Conference is a good thing. So. Uh, a second for a guy like Boyle is perfectly acceptable, and he'll fit in with Toronto very well. And Give him some good as they, leadership. Yeah, and as they're trying to make the playoffs as well, so good for them to actually be adding instead of selling for a change. He really kind of fits into what they lost with Phaneuf. The same type of player, the same veteran guy, and I think he's a better option than Phaneuf. Well, the difference being that Boyle's a forward, but... Oh, yeah, but you know what I mean, though. Like, that same kind of yeah. veteran player on that young team. Um, yeah, definitely not a blue line guy, but yeah, I think he's going to be he's gonna be a veteran among young men. Mm -hmm. 
Thomas Yurko went to the Chicago Blackhawks for a third round pick. This is about what I expected here too. Like when I saw him, I'm like, okay, fair price. I kind of expected to be like a fourth or a fifth, but yeah, it's basically a Sven Berchi trade. A good prospect on a team where the player's just not working out, so somebody else is trying to see if they can tap the magic that's there and. If it works out, great. If not, oh, gee, I lost an 85th overall pick. Big deal. And I think, to me, there's only one other trade that's probably worth really discussing, and that's the Kevin Shattenkirk trade that's still coming together as we record this. Shattenkirk goes to Washington in exchange for Washington's first-round pick this year, their second-round pick next year, and Zach Ranford. I'm All I can say about this is I'm glad that we are not an Eastern Conference team having to face Washington in the finals. Oh, for sure. And I just hope that for a change, Washington can actually power through and get to the Stanley Cup final for a change instead of always being the favorite and then finding a way to lose. Yeah, and, you know, Ovi deserves a cup. Like, this team has worked so hard every year. Um, I think you mentioned it earlier today. I hope they don't take on the Penguins in round one and end up getting knocked out. Yeah, like, it, it just, you gotta feel for that team. Like, they've been, like, the best team in the league for pretty much every year since Ovechkin came in. Off and on, of course, but, you know, like, always near the top, and I think they reached the conference finals once in that whole time. It just doesn't seem fair. And you know what? I think that if I'm looking at the money here, Shattenkirk definitely has to be a rental for these guys. I just can't see them. They're losing a lot of players next year, and I can't see them being able to afford Shattenkirk. So even with that in mind, it's like, yeah, you really hope they can do it after spending that much for this guy. Mm -hmm. But every year, there always seems to be the big trade deadline buyer who buys big and then ends up crapping out in the playoffs. Yeah. One has to wonder, though, with Washington buying from St. Louis uh, – Two teams that always struggle in the opening rounds of the playoffs. Is that the best target? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think St. Louis needed to make a move. From what I've read, there was a lot of Shattenkirk deals that died because Shattenkirk uh, wouldn't sign an extension with those teams. So I'm just wondering if they're kind of getting nervous and saying, you know what, it's a first and a second. Let's just take the deal and it's the best we're going to get. Mm-hmm. Um, the one thing I think is good about this, though, now that Shattenkirk's done on the twenty seventh, I think this opens up the market for Weidman. I think we're, yeah, I think we're going to see a stalemated market until Shattenkirk and a few other guys get moved. But I think now you'll see. You know what? Uh, maybe Weidman's the next best guy on the list for some teams. And there's been a couple other minor deals. Any anyone you want to mention? Uh, just a couple of minor things. Timu Polkinen got traded from Minnesota to Arizona for future considerations. I'm sure Arizona was going to claim him, but for paperwork reasons, it was just better to acquire him outright. Um, and Jordy Ben went to from Dallas to Montreal for Greg Pattern in the fourth. Uh, Pattern's wife uh, created a bit of a media storm in Montreal, and so it was... Uh, Get this guy off of our team as soon as possible. But even then, I think Ben will fit Basically, in both of them are the same guy defensively. It's just a fourth-round pick just to get the problem guy off of our team. Yeah. So, so nothing, um, nothing terribly exciting. Outside the Flames, we talked a lot about what we expect them to do on the first. Any other teams you're thinking or any players you're thinking are going to make a big splash as we get close to the deadline? <laughs> I could see Edmonton making a play for a couple of veteran depth guys. But I still think that Weidman makes the most sense to them, but uh, we'll, well see. What would you want uh, from I think Edmonton will be the biggest one just because I think they want to break their 10-year drought finally Why, to uh, get in the playoffs. Yeah, I think they're definitely in the playoffs this year. But you never know. It, they could, like, if the Talbot starts to struggle, they could sink like a rock, so... I think you might see Edmonton go out and try to get a goaltender for that reason, too. Um, I've been thinking over the last couple of days, I wonder if Edmonton might be in the hunt for Marc-Andre Fleury. That's possible. But, yeah, I could definitely see them trying to get in Weidman. I guess my question every time I hear that is, what do we want from Edmonton that's reasonable for Weidman? I'd take a third-round pick. 
That's what I think. I think at this point, you just take draft picks. I would try to defer to next year's draft if possible. Yeah, same here. Um, or even 2019. I don't know how many years in advance you can trade picks. I think three years in advance. But, uh, yeah, I, I would try to – I mean, I don't want to say we don't want any picks this year, but I wouldn't try to trade some to acquire picks in this year's draft unless you think you can wrap them up and do a Hamilton-style deal. Mm-hmm. So – any other Flames news you want to talk about this week? Just looking ahead to uh, the games that will be up upcoming this week. It's going to be a weird week for the Flames because they, they sort of have this start and stop schedule. If you take a look, they play on the 28th here at home against the LA Kings. And then they've got a couple days off. They play Detroit and have a day off and play the Islanders. And then three days off before they get into their hectic schedule. But before we look into that, let's look at last week. Uh, last week, we had eight points on the table, and you thought we'd get six. You th- thought we'd win everything but Florida. I thought we'd win Nashville and Carolina. I was right we won those, but we won all the other ones, too. So the Flames got all eight of the possible eight points. Can't complain with that. Well, that's it. I'm happy to be wrong with that one. So, Matt, the question now becomes how long do you think the win streak lasts? Uh, the 28th, we play the LA Kings at the Dome. At, it's a 7 p.m. start time. So for anyone Jones and for Flames Hockey, get your tickets for that. And then on the 3rd, if you want to come to the 3rd or the 5th, the 5th is a matinee game. Uh, those are going to be great games if for no other reason than, you know what, we've we've got the team here and we've got new players on the team, hopefully. We should see some new faces. So those will be good games for that reason. So go to our friends at Tick Ticks, download them on your mobile device, and grab some tickets for either one of those games because I think you'll see a whole bunch of new flames. Um, but it's it's a short week this week, only three games, and with the deadline, there's always some unrest on the team. How do you think we're going to do, Matt? I'm going to keep my tradition, newfound tradition of what the flames actually need out of this week and they need four points which four i think think they're gonna get the four from the last two games i don't think they'll beat la because i think la is gonna be gunning for us i think they need it a little more than we do so um yeah i know detroit's struggling right now i think that'll be an easy win I think the Islanders, we can beat them. It's a matinee, you never know, but we just did well on the matinee game. Yeah, well, the Islanders are doing better under Doug Waite, but that's more of a toss-up, but they need four points. I think they'll only beat Detroit, honestly, this week, but I they need four, at I, least. I'm going to be ballsy. I'm going to say that we're going to get all six. All right, going with the seven-game win streak. Okay. I think that you're going to see them get all six of them if... I think tomorrow in L.A., the or not tomorrow in L.A., sorry. I think the 28th in Calgary, tomorrow in Calgary, I think that L.A. plays Bishop. I Same think, here. I think that after acquiring them, you play them, and I just think that we might be able to get a few pucks that we shouldn't through Bishop just because it's a new team and he's not familiar with the defense and that sort of thing. So I think it'll be a hard-fought game, but I can see the Flames winning it just because of the new goaltender in net. So that's my prediction. Six points, you've got four. I'd be happy with either one of ours. Yeah, hopefully it's not less than that. And then after this is when the real challenge kicks in. On the 9th, uh, Montreal comes town. Then after that, we are playing... Literally every other day right through the rest. No hyperbole. We play the 9th, the 11th, the 13th, the 15th, the 17th, the 19th, 21st, 23rd, 25th, 27th, 29th, 31st. And then right through in April, we play the 2nd, the 4th, the 6th, the 8th. So I don't know whose bright idea this bye week thing was, but it's going to cause the Flames some problems this month. Yeah, well, apparently they're looking at having a second bye week next season, so that'll be interesting. Really? A second one? Yeah. I remember seeing something about Daly saying that. Yeah, so that'll make things a little bit more fun. That's crazy. That's nuts. Um... So the Flames better get their practices in now while they still can. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I don't know. It's it's definitely going to be a tough month. And most the good thing is most of these games are at home. And so if the Flames can play well at the Dome, they should be okay. But it's going to be some tough teams in there. we got Montreal, Pittsburgh, Boston, L.A., twice. 
Uh, the Capitals, that's not going to be a fun game on the 21st. No, basically from the 21st on, it's going to be Murderer's Row. Yeah, so you got to... Or the, from the 19th on, it's L.A., Washington, Nashville, St. Louis, then one easy game in Colorado, then it's L.A., San Jose, and Anaheim twice. See, so. if both goalies are healthy in L.A., which I'm not convinced they are, but if Quick is ready to go... The great advantage LA is going to have is they could just swap goalies on you just so it's harder to scout their guys. Sure. You play one bishop, then a quick, then a bishop again. Because we play them, what, one, two, three? Four times. Four times. Um, so, yeah, that's crazy. No, th I count three. Because um, we don't play them again in, in – oh, no, yeah, three times. But that's still a lot. And then we've got two games against Anaheim, one in Anaheim in April. So we can pencil that as a loss right now. But it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be a weird game. Yep. So, Matt, you have a good week. Enjoy the trade deadline hype. And I will talk to you next week on around the 6th, and we will talk about what we think of what the Flames did or didn't do at the deadline. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good week, and go Flames, go. This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash fireside chat. And to follow us on Twitter at fireside podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non Commercial Share Alike license. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz. <laughs>